Greetings, everybody. Uh, welcome to the departmental uh, seminar for this week. And uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Lachlan Gunn. He's a PhD student uh, working on uh, the fish food distribution system, which is a security uh, protocol. Um, Lachlan uh, did his bachelor's with us and also did a master's plan in that uh, did a joint degree and uh, won the Zunder Prize. And uh, he's also recently won an Endeavour scholarship to go to France. And you're leaving Rotterdam and Basel in a month or two. Uh, yep, yep, in July. In July. So, um, and he's uh, put together a very interesting book about this uh, security system. So, can you all give him a big hand, please? Hi, um, so volume's okay? So I'm uh, Lachlan Gunn, as I uh, mentioned, I've been working on a um, cryptographic scheme uh, that's been introduced in the last uh, 10 years or so called the Kish Key Distribution Scheme. And uh, that's what I'm going to talk about today. So quantum key distribution uh, was invented in the mid 80s. And that uh, brought forward a lot of hope because it was one of the first schemes that could be proven based on the laws of physics to be secure. But one of the problems is doing this is quite difficult because it involves single photons and so it needs expensive detectors and it's sensitive to basically anything going wrong. And when you're talking about single photons, a lot can go wrong. Um, and so people have been trying to come up with classical systems to try to provide the same levels of security, but without any of these downsides. And so one of these is called the Kish Key Distribution System. That was first introduced in uh, around 2005. And we're going to describe a new attack uh, that takes advantage of the propagation times uh, along the line that contains this information. So, briefly, what is the Kish Key Distribution System, or KKD? Well, it is a classical system for key agreement. So it doesn't need to depend upon the behaviour of single photons. So you don't have to worry about things like detector efficiency or anything like that. It's simple, it's cheap, and it's security it claims rather than being based upon the no cloning theorem, like the quantum cryptography, <coughs> Sorry, are based on the second law of thermodynamics, which, just briefly, the idea of the second law of thermodynamics is if you have two hot objects, so you've got two, say, metal cylinders that are heated red hot, and you press them together, you're not going to find that the heat suddenly goes from one to the other and one goes down to room temperature and one becomes... Well, I won't say too hot to touch, but it uh, becomes white hot, say. And so, but before we get onto this, I know most of you aren't security people, and even amongst security people, uh, this type of system is a fairly niche area. So I'm going to go uh, a bit into the background of the field and try to give a brief introduction into the area. So information theoretic security is a type of provable security that uses the statistics of messages and key bits and such to try to show what information an attacker could get out of a message. And the idea is that if you use an information theoretic proof, it doesn't depend at all upon how much computational power the attacker has. For example, uh, with most cryptography systems, an attacker could conceivably, if they had enough time and money and computers, go through and try every key and see which of the many, which of the uh, two to the power of 256, say, will uh, give a reasonable message. But with an information theoretic cryptographic scheme, they can't do that because the nature of the key that's used is such that it's equally likely to be one message as the other. And so this is the strictest kind of provable security. So you can have a few different levels of secrecy uh, under this type of uh, under this type of uh, regime. So the easiest one is to have no security at all. And this is really convenient. Um, I mean, it sounds like I'm talking about just uh, sending messages in the clear, which isn't to say we don't do that a lot, but um, things like, for example, RSA or AES, they fall into this category because an attacker with enough computational power could theoretically break them. It might not be possible to do that at this point in time, or it might be that there are unknown weaknesses in them, for example, that will make that practical in the future. But in a statistical sense, it is possible. And therefore, 
um, from an information theoretic point of view, there is no security. At the other end of the spectrum is what's called perfect secrecy. So an eavesdropper who has access to the message, uh, sorry, who has access to the ciphertext, so what you've sent over the wire, they don't get any information out of that ciphertext. The standard, uh, the traditional um, way that you might think about this is you've got two armies that are trying to send messages to each other and they want to say, they, need, they both need to attack at the same time. And so one sends a message to the other, attack or don't attack. And the idea is that in an information theoretic scheme, an arm, the, uh, say the besieged city, even if they've got access to this information, they, are no, they know no better uh, than they did before whether the armies are going to attack. But the problem is that doing this requires a long key. You need a key that is the same length of the message and it has to stay completely secret. It can never be reused and the eavesdropper mustn't get any information on that. And this is difficult because it means that you essentially have to carry around this key uh, to the other person. And so this has been limited in usage. For example, there have been some diplomatic ministries that have used it. The German diplomatic ministry used it in the 20s before um, Enigma and such came into being. And the Russian uh, security service have used it in the 50s, uh, 40s and 50s. Though interestingly, we did manage to actually break the Russian one for a brief period of time because when the Germans were at the, uh, basically at uh, Moscow, people got a bit slack about uh, procedures and so things got reused. And as a result, for a few years after that, we were able to break a small percentage of the messages that the Russians sent. But uh, theoretically, the system is unbreakable and because, of, uh, because they got it right most of the time, we never broke any significant number of messages. But there is a happy medium. So if you've got some physical process that uh, Alice and Bob can both measure, then this allows you to generate some, say, correlated binary variables if you want to look at it in a technical sense. But the idea is that you can use uh, coding schemes and such so that even as the amount of information that's been sent, even as that information approaches infinity, then um, then the eavesdropper only gets a finite amount of information. So you can send forever and ever and ever and you might be able to guarantee that the eavesdropper will only get three bits of information, which isn't much in the scheme of things, but um, obviously you need to make sure that those three bits aren't um, important ones. And it's relatively convenient to do, as I said, because you just have to measure some uh, process. So one example of this is if you had a satellite that's broadcasting a signal, so Alice, Bob and E, Alice and Bob both measure the signal that's coming from the satellite and they've got some noise, so that's what these uh, circles here represent. Now, Eve can do the same thing, she can measure the same key, but she's got some noise as well. But so, an interesting result, and a rather almost surprising and rather exciting result, I think, is that if you can bound the amount of noise that Eve has, so if you can find some lower limit to the amount of um, uncertainty that the eavesdropper experiences, then there is a rate which is called CS, the secrecy rate, in which you can communicate secretly. So this is a bit like the Shannon rate. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with uh, communications theory, the idea of the Shannon rate is that for a channel, there is, um, there is a certain rate at which you can push information through. And it might be that you can put more bits per second through, but there'll be some uncertainty in what's received. And no matter how clever your error correction is or whatever, you can't do better than that. And this is similar. There is a certain rate at which you can communicate without, uh, without leaking an appreciable amount of information to an eavesdropper. And above that, no matter how clever you are, um, some information is going to leak. But how do you do this? Because all they've got, all Alice and Bob have is some set of bits that they've worked out. There are going to be some errors and Eve's going to have some information. So the way that they start is Alice and Bob want to keep their error rate as low as possible. And they might have, in the example here I'm going to use 20%, but obviously you want it to be lower to start with, but they want to make this as low as possible. 
Now, the way that you might do this in a normal communication system is to use a forward error correction code, so something like Reed Solomon or some convolutional code. But the problem uh, with this is that that code is going to have a positive effect for Eve as well, because an eavesdropper can then use that to correct her errors. And so her noise bound drops as well, and so that uh, interferes with your hope of um, achieving the secrecy rate. And so what you need is you need a special protocol that will let Alice and Bob correct their own errors, but not improve uh, the situation for Eve. And so we use a technique called information reconciliation, in which Alice and Bob use an interactive protocol in which they'll send information back and forth and then try to drop bits that they believe are in error. And this will cause their error rate to drop. But because they're not able to detect um, Eve's errors, because obviously if hers are independent, then obviously when Alice and Bob communicate, they don't appear. And so her, er her bits get dropped essentially at random, and her error rate doesn't improve at all. So one way to do this, it's not necessarily the most efficient way, is you take two pairs of bits. So you take a pair of bits at each end, and you compute a parity bit, so you just XOR them together. So in this case, Alice and Bob both have two zeros. So they say, well, okay, well, there's even parity. They'll send that to each other. And they say, okay, well, we can't see an error there, so uh, let's just run with that and keep those bits. But then there's one slight catch in that now that they've sent that parity bit, that's given some information to an eavesdropper because that has to be just sent over the wire as is. And so the trick is that if they then drop one of those two bits, then that parity bit doesn't give any information anymore. Because that even parity essentially says those two bits are the same. They could be zero or they could be one, but an eavesdropper could use that information. But since, uh, since one of those bits has been dropped, then that doesn't tell you anything. And in the case where there's an error, so we'll say that Bob accidentally got a 1 here, then they'll see Alice will see even parity, Bob will see odd parity. They'll send that information to each other. And they say, OK, well, we don't know exactly which bit's an error, but in the, of those two bits, at least one of them has to be wrong. So they throw it away. Throw both away, I should say. And so by doing this, this causes Alice and Bob to reduce their error rate because they're throwing away blocks uh, that contain, that definitely contain bits, uh, er bit errors, and they keep uh, blocks that might not. <coughs> so as a graphical example, the red, uh, the red pixels here represent uh, errors, the grey ones are bits that are correct, and then as we throw bits away they'll turn white. So we start off with Bob and Eve having independent errors, and he'll start off with 20% and Eve will start off with 10%. So to start off with, Bob's in a much worse situation than Eve. And you can see just visually how much more red there is uh, on the left. Now, we perform one uh, iteration of this. And suddenly, Bob's side becomes a lot less red, and the statistics bear this out. His error rate drops from 20% down to 6. Then we do it, well, Eve stays the same, I should say. Then we do it again, and now all of a sudden Bob only has half a percent error rate, while Eve's has stayed the same. So we started off with uh, Bob being in a much worse situation than e the eavesdropper. But now, Alice and Bob have a big advantage. I could go a bit further than this, but uh, if I actually go any further, um, there won't be any errors left, and you'll just see a grey square, and that wouldn't be terribly interesting. But, um, so the next step is once we've done this, so Eve still has a 10% error rate, so she'll still guess the bit 90% of the time. And so what we want to do is increase that error rate. We want to make, um, make Eve, and put Eve into the situation in which her guess as to what the uh, key bit is, is basically chance. She can't do better. So one thing that you can do that will cause the error rate to go up is to just XOR adjacent bits together. Because then 
Um, if you've got an error in one of those bits, you'll, it'll propagate through and you'll get an error in the output. Um, and so this causes, uh, this causes your error rate to increase roughly proportionally to the error rate if you've got a low one to start with. So to show this graphically, we start off with the error rates that we had uh, at the end of the last iteration. So Bob has half a percent, Eve has 10 percent. And again, you can see how much redder um, Eve's is than Bob's. So we do one iteration, and you see we're throwing away half the bits because um, we're storing blocks of two. But now Bob's error rate has increased a bit. It's doubled from half a percent to one percent. But this only means an extra uh, one bit in 200 in error. So it's not a big deal. But for Eve, the situation is a lot worse because hers is almost doubled. So there's another one bit in 10 that's uh, broken. And so now her situation is worse. And it only gets worse as time goes on. Um, we do blocks of 4 and blocks of 8. So XOR, take 8 bits, XOR them all together, and use that as our key bit. And so now Eve has gotten it wrong almost half the time. So she can't do much better than Charms. And you can keep doing this as long as you want, and that'll approach 50%. So Eve is getting almost no information on the key out of the measurements that she's made. I'll briefly touch on active attackers, uh, though I won't go into this uh, in great detail later. But you have to consider the possibility that since Alice and Bob have to send things like parity bits across the wire, that an eavesdropper might um, try to change things along the way and try to interfere and in doing so uh, get the information. Because she could, for example, pretend to be bo Bob and then uh, talk to Alice and then send the information on to Bob. And that's got a man in the middle attack. But it turns out that in this case, these attacks are all or nothing and there's a criteria, cri there's a criterion which you can use to determine whether um, an eavesdropper can break the system this way. So we call this uh, condition simulatability. And I've put up the definition there, I won't go to it in great detail, but the idea essentially is that, um, the idea essentially is whether or not an eavesdropper can successfully impersonate one of the endpoints. Because if she has a noisier uh, measurement, then she can't pretend to be Alice without causing, without getting a higher error rate. So she has to be able to successfully impersonate either Alice or Bob. And that was just a formalization, which um, wasn't uh, actually discovered until 2003. Now. If this is the case, then there are two possibilities, and only two. So either Eve can simulate Alice or Bob, one of the two, and if so, the secrecy rate is zero. So Alice and Bob can't communicate secretly at all. But the other possibility is that the secrecy is that uh, she can't simulate either of them, and so in this case, the secrecy rate stays the same. So there's no middle ground. You don't have to worry about an attacker could. Uh, you don't have to worry about the possibility that an attacker could interfere and that reduces the rate somewhat. Um, either it's sec not secure at all, in which case you know, or it's secure and as secure as it was otherwise. So active attackers aren't a big problem and they're not a problem in terms of system design. Now the secrecy rate is actually slightly finicky to um, calculate. and. Normally what we do is use these error bounds. Now the secrecy rate again is the number of so it's the number of uh, bits of secure information that can be transmitted for each iteration of the protocol. Now we can find these and I won't go into great detail on this for the moment, but they're just standard uh, mutual information standard mutual information and you can uh, just feed in some probability distributions into those formula and uh, get numbers out where X, Y and Z are the information available to Alice, Bob and Eve respectively. So just a brief summary 
information theoretic security isn't just the one-time fab. So it doesn't mean someone with a random number generator generating a long code book and then trying to secretly smuggle it to spies inside a fire engine or something, which is what has been happening. If you look around on the internet, you can see um, you can see some pictures which I haven't included in this slideshow, um, but they were captured by Canadian Customs once. Um, and security is possible even against active attackers. Um, so before I go on to KKD, does anyone have any questions about this uh, background uh, stuff? So about information theoretic security? Okay. Um, so the Kishki distribution system, it's really simple, especially compared to uh, quantum key distribution, because rather than using a whole lot of really expensive detectors and such, it has two resistors at each end, two resistors and a switch connecting them to a wire. And that's it for the idealized system. In practice, you need to include some other stuff in order to um, make it work practically and to secure against certain attacks. But in the ideal, ideal case, it just looks like this. And so each time you want to generate a bit, you just set those two switches randomly. So Alice and Bob will set their switches at random and then they'll measure the voltage on the line. Now, a resistor will generate noise because it's got a conductor in it and because there is heat, that'll cause the electrons to buffet around and as they move around, that'll cause a voltage to appear. And so you measure this voltage and we know a formula for it, which is 4KTBR, so K is the Boltzmann constant, T is the temperature and B is the bandwidth of the system and you just multiply that by the resistance. Now, because we've got two resistors here in parallel, we have RA in parallel with RB. But the important thing to note here is that if you swap those two resistors around, that doesn't change the voltage. And that uh, turns out to be the basis of the security for the system. So for convenience, let's just set 4KTB to be equal to two. And then you get, um, if you both pick the small resistor, uh, make it one ohm, then you get one volt squared on the line. Now, if you make, uh, if you both pick the large resistors, so if Alice and Bob both pick two ohms, then they'll get two volts on the line, two volts squared on the line. So they can, uh, you can tell the difference between those two by the voltage that you've measured. Where things get interesting, though, if one's picked the big one and one's picked the small one, so then both of these states have 1.33 volts squared. And this is interesting because an eavesdropper can't distinguish between those two states. Alice and Bob, though, can. Now, the reason for this is that they know which resistor they have chosen. So Alice has picked R1, and she knows that. So she only has to look along this column and work out which of those two states the system's in. So she just has to distinguish between 1 volt squared and 1.33 volt squared. The other alternative uh, sorry, and at the other end, so Bob has to work out which state he's in, and he knows that he's picked the big resistor. So he looks down this column and says, okay, well, is it 1.33 volts or 2 volts? And just has to distinguish between those two states. So for Alice and Bob, working out which of those four states they're in is easy. But for E, it's difficult because she has, to w she has this ambiguity. Uh, which she can't overcome just by measuring that voltage. And so the way we make use of this is that, so those two bits, which I've marked zero and one there, we'll keep those and use those as key bits. The other two states, which are marked insecure there, uh, we just throw them away and try again. Set, we're going to set the switches at random and um, hope that we land in one of the secure states next time. But then the two questions that spring to mind are, well, are the voltages in those two states, so these 1.33 volts here, are those voltages really identical in practice when you go to implement the system? And are the, uh, and is this, is this voltage really all there is to it? I, are there more measurements that an eavesdropper could make that would allow her to distinguish between zero and one? And as it turns out, with, this, uh, with the idealized lumped model, the answer is yes, and yes, with a slight caveat that the current does, uh, the current can be measured, 
and it is somewhat indep it is independent of the voltage, but it doesn't provide any new information. So the question then is, what happens if you look at more detailed models that take into account imperfections in all of these components? And this has been done. Now, the first one that was suggested was that incorrect component values could cause uh, an information leak because if those resistor values are incorrect at each end, then this is going to result in those voltages not all being as expected. And so the zero and one voltages will be slightly different. But in practice, this isn't a problem because if you can get uh, those, those resistors to within, say, 1%, uh, within 1% tolerance, then the deviations are small and they're not small enough for an eavesdropper to extract any significant amount of information. Line resistance is another problem as well. I'm going to talk about that in a bit more detail in a moment. But as it turns out, you can actually compensate for this by doing a calibration step. Uh, I won't go into great detail about it, but the idea is essentially that you consider the line to be part of one of those two resistors and then adjust everything accordingly. But in this talk, we're going to talk about dynamic effects, and in particular, propagation down the line. Because all of the previous analyses have been quantistatic. And by that, I mean the assumption is that any voltages going down the line are going to propagate instantly. Whereas in practice, you know that there's a speed of light delay, and it will take time for a voltage to appear at the other end. And therefore, um, because this isn't modelled, this opens an avenue for attack. But before we can look at specific attacks, we have to work out how we can evaluate them, because you need some figure of merit. And the way we do this uh, today is to use the secrecy rate. But it turns out this is actually slightly tricky to uh, this is slightly tricky to work out because you have quite a lot of variables in the system. For starters, you've got the actual choices of resistors that were done. But as well, because you were using random signals, because the noise is random, a random Gaussian signal then the measurements, the estimates that Bob, Alice and Bob make of the resistors, so these two, the uh, estimates that Alice and Bob make of the resistor of the other person, they are going to be wrong some of the time, and so you have to take those into account. And the same is with E, so E will try to guess which resistances Alice and Bob have, but they're likely to be wrong uh, some of the time as well. And so you end up with this actually quite large probability space. And uh, this means you need to do quite a lot of, um, you need to do quite a lot of work to work out the secrecy rate. And of course, because we don't care about bits that are thrown away, we uh, condition this on the bit being kept. So again, uh, so Alice uh, knows this information X, which contains her resistor and what she thinks Bob has. Bob knows the opposite. Oops, sorry, there's an error there. Bob knows uh, what he has and what he thinks Alice has. And Eve only knows what her estimates are. She doesn't know anything for certain. And the rest, we can compute entropies and mutual informations using the standard uh, information theoretic formula, which I won't go into detail on. But if you remember, there were um, I gave bounds before for the secrecy rate based on uh, some mutual informations, and so you can calculate uh, you can calculate all of these based on probability distributions for these, and then plug that into the formula, and you get a nice bound, which turns out to be quite tight in our case. So let's go on and apply this to the KKD system. So imagine you're Bob, and you've measured this voltage on the line, uh, these voltages on the line, and you want to work out which Alice is which is Alice's resistor. Because qualitatively, you know that if it's big, she's probably picked the big voltage, big resistor, and if the voltage is small, she's probably picked the small one. But it's important to know exactly where the cutoff between big and small is if you want to keep your error rate low. And so you can use Bayes' law to find the probability, uh, to find the probability that the resistor is in a particular state. And as it turns out, this is equal to maximum likelihood. So th these are likelihood functions. And you basically just calculate these two things, which you can do easily, and then see which of them is larger. 
and that's what we do. So you can work this out analytically and you get this test. <coughs> and so you just plug V squared, the voltage measurements into this. And if that is greater than zero, then you know that, um, you so and if that's greater than zero, then you know that Allison's resistor is most likely to be the big one or vice versa if it's less than zero. And I won't go into detail about this, but I just want to make it clear that there are analytic formulae for the error rate in this case. Um, this is a single sample case. You can increase the orders of things if you've got multiple samples. But um, so in this case, you can do this analytically and find out what uh, the error rate for Allison Bob will have is. So this is important when you're trying to design the system and determine how long you want to measure for. But Eve has a trickier job because she doesn't, uh, she doesn't have to distinguish just between two states. She has to distinguish between four. And on top of that, how she interprets those states will be different depending upon who's sending information and who's receiving it. Because if Alice has gotten a situation, if Alice has worked out, uh, if Alice and Bob have worked out um, the states incorrectly and they've made a mistake, Eve doesn't have the ability to say, no, no, you've got it wrong. Go, you know, go back, try again. She has to work with what she's got. And so this changes how those states map into key bits. Because, um, because she needs to know which resistor the sending party is using. Because it's the sender um, who determines what the key bit is. But she also has another trick up her sleeve, which is that Alice and Bob will throw away any bits that they believe to be, sorry, any uh, states that they believe to be in one of the insecure states. So what she has to do as well is work out whether if, um, work out whether for, any, for all of those four states, whether given the measurements that she's made, whether they would have kept that state. Because for example, if, um, if uh, Alice and Bob were in the high state, like the, the, the one that's got the big voltage in the bottom right corner, if they would have definitely thrown away, um, if they would have definitely thrown away the bit given the measurements that they made, then obviously if they decide to keep it, it means that they're not in that state. So this decision whether or not to throw the bit away is important. And again, you, she can find a test for whether, in this case, whether Alice's resistor is the big or the small, the big or the small one, and this is this looks reasonably complicated, and I suppose it is reasonably complicated. But um, these are multivariate normal probability densities, so these are all just standard formulae, and these size here, so these sides here, are zero if the bit would be thrown away, and one if not. So the effect is that you've got you're comparing linear combinations of these and you're throwing away terms that are impossible. So now let's look at some specific attacks. So the Shoei River attack used the line resistance, and this was uh, introduced in the early days of the system. So let's suppose you've got this line resistance, RC, between Alice and Bob. And now imagine you're at Alice's end of the line, and you would calculate the voltage. You can just use standard circuit analysis to find what this voltage is. And then if you work out what the mean squared voltage is, you get this formula. And now if you look at that for a few seconds, you'll be able to work out that if you swap RA and RB, that voltage is different. Which means that those two states, the zero and the one state, which ideally would be identical, end up being different. But the question then is, how different are they? Well. The formula for this tends, turns out to be relatively, um, relatively nice. And if we feed in the practical numbers that have been used in the systems uh, demonstrated so far, you'll see that the voltage um, at the end of the line will be on the order of one volt squared. But the change in that voltage, so the change in the ventured voltage, is only going to be tiny. It will be less than a percent. And so it's only a tiny, tiny change in the distribution of the thing that you measure. 
And so an eavesdropper would need a lot of samples, a huge number of samples, in order to reliably distinguish between, um, between those two stacks. And this is borne out by the secrecy rate, which we've, the way we've worked this out is we've simulated uh, the system for each of these points. Uh, so for each of these numbers of measurement times, basically, we've simulated the system a uh, hundred thousand times to find out what the that big probability um, function was and then computed all of the entropies to find the secrecy rate. And you see that this peaks at a relatively high value. It's almost one. It only The secrecy rate only drops by a few percent because of this attack. And therefore, in a practical system, the attack is not... Uh, the attack is not... Uh, terribly meaningful because you can't uh, you can't get at very much information. So this turns out not to be a problem. But as I said before, it is possible to avoid this attack and to counteract it by changing the value by changing the uh, voltages at each end to compensate for that line resistance. I won't go into detail about that, but it is possible. The other consideration is temperature mismatch. Now I just talked before about resist about having resistors connect to the line and how they generate thermal noise. But that amount of noise is very small. It's nanovolts per root hertz. And so in a practical system, you might get on the order of, at best, microvolts, um, RMS of noise. And so you've got two alternatives if you want to try to make a reasonable amount of noise, say, one volt uh, RMS. So one way is just to heat up the resistor. Now, this is problematic because to get to one volt RMS would need about 10 to the 18 Kelvin. And this is excessive. excessive. Um, and so we go to the slightly easier alternative, which is to just use an artificial resistor. And the way we do this is we put a voltage source that has produces Gaussian noise, and we put that in series with the resistor. Now. You can model a resistor for the purposes of thermal noise as being just a resistor in series with a Gaussian noise source. So for the view of the outside world, if you've got a truly random uh, noise source, then this is identical um, to a resistor that is 10 to the 18 Kelvin hot. And so this lets you get that level of noise without um, having to do things that are physically impossible. But the trick is there, you have to get those uh, you have to get those temperatures to be identical because otherwise you get the mis you get a mismatch. And so what happens if say our voltage references at each end are off by a little bit and therefore the noise uh, the noise voltages are different at each end? Well suppose a, the rather exaggerated example that the temperature is off by a factor of two. So Bob voltage reference is really terrible and is about 40% higher than, uh, than it should be. Then the mean squared voltage you'll see on the line will look like this. And obviously because you've got that 2 there, if you swap RA and RB around, then the voltages are going to be quite a bit different. And so uh, what happens is this: you get this table and you see these two states have quite different um, mean squared voltages. So they're, rea they're quite distinguishable. Now the question then is how much does that um, reduce security? Because while they're distinguishable, you know, they're less distinguishable than, um, than these two are, for example. So we worked out the secrecy rate through simulation and we can see that they start off the same because they're dominated basically by errors that Alex and Bob made. But then if you look at the one that's really a long way off, so 40% error, so that's like we were talking about originally, this basically peaks very quickly and then falls off catastrophically. If you have one that's not quite as bad, so 20% voltage error, it peaks, falls off less badly. And if you've got 2% error, it peaks, and you can see it's just starting to fall off, but over reasonable durations, 
and practical systems are talking on the order of, say, 20 uh, steady state samples, it's not falling off to any substantial degree. And so, even if you've got a 2% error rate, which is the kind of error rate that you'd get if you basically went to Farnell, bought a cheap voltage reference, and then put it straight into the circuit without checking to see whether it actually was the same, that's the kind of error rate that you, that's the kind of error that you would get. And so, we see that this attack doesn't cause any substantial reduction in, uh, doesn't cause any substantial reduction in security. So this is all looking quite, you know, rosy. But um, then what about theoretical analysis of the system? Because we've looked at specific attacks, but from a security perspective, you need to be able to defend against all classes of attacks, and not just the ones you've thought of. And so there's been information theoretic analysis done. And the claim's been made that because the Maxwell's equations are causal in the sense that you can't have information essentially tunneling over an eavesdropper. So you can't have an e Alice here, eavesdropper, uh, sorry, Bob here, an eavesdropper here, and then have information go through here and then secretly go around. Any information that goes from Alice to Bob has to pass through that intervening space. And so an eavesdropper who has a directional coupler and so can see the waves travelling in each direction should be able to get hold of all that information. And so you feed that into the formula for the secrecy rate, and that says that the secrecy rate should be zero. So this is a problem because all of the experimental work that's been done so far and all of the attacks that people have been able to come up with have suggested that the system should be almost 100% secure um, and that it's very, very good. Whereas if you look at these results, that are completely non-constructive, so they don't give any sense of exactly how you might go about doing this. These results suggest that there should be no security. So that raises an interesting question. Is it that in the model that's been used for the information theoretic work, is it that that model is incorrect and that it's missing out some fundamental piece of information? Or is it that uh, the experimental work that's been done, that it hasn't just hasn't come up with a clever enough attack? So that's uh, the interesting question, and that's what um, we've been seeking to find out. So we can build a directional coupler. Um, you can buy them from, you know, you can buy them from mini circuits or wherever. Um, we built one because we wanted to also answer some other physical questions at the same time, and so we built one that uh, used a very direct, that used a very direct way to try to separate the waves going in each direction. So we built one of these connected to the line and then tried to see whether um, whether you could distinguish between the two states based on what the waves going in each direction looked like. And it turns out that you couldn't do this without some loss in the line. So if you assumed that the line is of negligible length, which is essentially making a quasi-static assumption, then you couldn't break the system that way which is interesting because it means that if those previous information theoretic results are correct, it means therefore that the failure in the system has to have something to do with propagation down the line. Because if it's secure at zero length, good, but if you make it non-zero length, it's completely insecure. There has to be something about that sudden transition where interesting behaviour happens. And that's, um, and that's where we um, are going with this talk. So we've introduced a new technique to try to take advantage of the physical length of the transmission line. So when we start, when we switch those uh, resistors in, you start the voltage at zero, and then you turn on your sources. And then all of a sudden, so the voltages go up, then imagine you're sitting in the middle of the line and looking at the voltage. Then, from your perspective, Alice and Bob, they send their signals through, but you're, they've s turned on their sources. But nothing's happened yet, because you're 50 kilometres away from them. And so it takes two microseconds for their signals to reach you. And then, at that point, the temperature starts going up and up, because their voltages are increasing. And everything event it eventually reaches the top, and you get that steady state where you get 4 kTPR noise.
but that was in the centre of the line. Now, if you're measuring the voltage at Alice's end, then you can see her noise temperature will increase immediately because you're right next to her, and so her signals will reach you immediately. But when Bob um, switches his on, it takes him four microseconds for the noise to reach you. And so during this period of time here, you're only seeing noise due to Alice and none due to Bob. And so you've got this big temperature mismatch, which we said before wasn't a big problem, but that was if you had only a 2% error, for example. But in this case, things are really catastrophic because one of them has zero temperature and one has non-zero. And so you get essentially the worst temperature mismatch imaginable. Now, we're going to just look at the period where just one of those sources is visible. So just this period here between two and four microseconds. Um, it's possible to make use of the other part, but uh, with the tools we've got available at the moment, um, with the mathematical tools we've got at the moment, it's not uh, practical to do so. However, under a transmission line, with a transmission line model, you can connect a resistor to a transmission line and that will produce noise and that will propagate outwards as a wave. And now you can use that, you can uh, use that analysis to show that the wave that comes out of that resistor is going to have this strength, where gamma is the reflection coefficient of the resistor. Now, you look at the variance of this and you measure this value and that tells you what gamma is and so it tells you what the resistor is. And this changes quite a lot with the resistor, I should say. And the result is that, so an eavesdropper sitting near one end of the line can work out <coughs> which resistor um, the nearest person has. So if they're near, if she's near Alice, she can work out Alice's resistor. And if she's near Bob, she can work out Bob's resistor. And she can do that with about a 75% chance of getting it right. So this is significant in terms of, um, in terms of the information that she can get. And I've plotted the error rates for Alice and Bob as well. And so the trick is that if you want to increase, um, if you want to increase her error rate, so if you want to reduce the information leak, you want to make those two resistors close together in value, because then that makes this value, these two values close together. And so it's harder to distinguish because during that time, she can essentially only get one sample. And so to counteract that, because changing that also increases Alice's and Bob's error rate, they have to increase their measurement time. So they have to move, for example, from this curve into this curve. So that's all well and good. I mean, it slows the system down, but you can live with that if it makes it more secure. But it also exacerbates the other attacks that we showed. So, for example, in the temperature mismatch attack uh, that I showed before, you saw plots where the secrecy rate would go up with measurement rate, and then it would eventually peak, and then as you increase the measurement time from there, it would fall away. And if you keep increasing this measurement time, that'll exacerbate those problems. Whereas uh, it will let you improve uh, resistance against this type of attack. So you've got this interesting trade-off where you've got several types of attack, and each time you try to uh, be more resistant to one of them, you make things worse for the other. But that's not all that we can do because, in fact, Eve can do this in two places. So she can do it right next to Alice and she can put another box right next to Bob that will perform this attack in each place. And so she actually gets two estimates for what the resistors are. And as a result, she, uh, she gets better accuracy in terms of which state uh, the system's in. And this uh, works well for her, but uh, it means that finding the error rate is harder. The analytic formulae uh, are no good here. And so we have to do this by simulation. And um, so at last we'll give you the final result, which is that the secrecy rate ends up, being drop ends up dropping by 30%. And this isn't with contrived uh, values for the resistors or contrived values for the powers involved. Um, with the standard values as used in uh, practical systems now, you can reduce the 
amount of data that's being put through secretly by 30%. And this is important because it means that suddenly those coding techniques, which you know previously um, were causing, you know, which previously were necessary to um, avoid a slight, um, a very slight information leak, are now vital because there's a, a relatively large amount of information leaking out through this um, through this attack, but which now needs to be dealt with at the coding stage. So. A lot more attention needs needs to be paid to privacy amplification, for example, uh, due to this attack. But as well, there are other things that we can do. Um, we can change the resistances. Um, we'd suggest something like five kilohms, and then that will allow the error rate to er Eve's error rate to increase without causing undue burden to Alice and Bob. But the trade-off between error rate and security, we've not yet explored that. And it's possible that reducing this could uh, end up being counterproductive. So that'll be uh, an interesting topic for your future work to try to better work out um, what the trade-off is between increasing security while without uh, causing the error rate to increase such that you end up losing more than you gain. But the key thing to take out of this is privacy amplification is unavoidable. It had been previously spoken about, for example, that perhaps privacy amplification was unnecessary because the error rate of the eavesdropper is so close to 50% that she couldn't get a substantial information amount of information out. But now if she can get it right more than 75% of the time, then this becomes a big problem and it's not something that can be ignored anymore. And therefore, it's really vital to consider uh, this attack when designing a new system. So, in conclusion, we've described an attack against the KKD system that uses propagation delays. So we've thrown away the quasi-static assumption and then tried to look at the real physics of the system at a low level in order to try to determine uh, whether there are any weaknesses because of this. And we've shown that by doing the attack in this way, we can reduce the secrecy rate of the system, so the amount of information that can be sent through securely, by about 30%. So this is a substantial uh, change and changes substantially the design parameters of uh, this type of system. But I should point out that again, we only looked at a small part of the turn on time. So we only looked at about four microseconds of, we only looked for about four microseconds at part of the, um, at part of the operation of the system that could last for several milliseconds or more. And so there's a lot more, a lot of potential to further mine information from there that uh, with more mathematical work could uh, potentially be gleaned. So, yeah, thank you for listening. That's um, all I've got. Um. Um, well, there is, I mean, there is, yeah, so the question is, is it true that there is really information yeah. being yeah. sent because everything in the system is random and therefore if it's, ran if it's all being randomly selected, is there any information really being transmitted? And, and this is for the purposes of uh, this information theoretic analysis. And to that I'd say um, that while everything's being set random, there is information being sent because there is um, information in the randomness. And in particular, there's information in the random noise that's being put onto the line. And so because at Bob's end, the voltage on the line is being influenced by the voltage from Alice's voltage source, then 
there is some information being transferred in that sense. Um, this is at a lower level than the this is at a lower level than the uh, key agreement level, because yes, it's true that they're agreeing on a random key. They're not actually sending information during this process, but at the same time, there is information being sent back and forth because they have to put this noise onto the line. They have to generate this noise and then fill the line with it. And in doing so, uh, there is information on the state of their noise sources uh, going to the other end. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Thanks. something about what you think are the limits to the net ultimate length of the line that you could possibly have? Yeah, okay, so in the past, yeah, because of the, uh, the use of quasi-static assumptions in the, uh, in the analysis of the system, then it's been previously required that basically you want the line to be a good approximation of this, and as such, uh, the line has can't be any longer than, say, um, a tenth of a wavelength of the maximum bandwidth in the system. So you have to determine the bandwidth of your noise source uh, and set the line accordingly. So if you want a longer line, you have to use a noise source with a smaller bandwidth so that um, the quasi-static assumption isn't violated. Now, that's not necessarily the entire story, and we've got talking about things like this where potentially you can look at um, where you can look at uh, how the noise travels along the line at a very low level, and possibly that will change things. Maybe it will mean that uh, you can use a longer line, or maybe it will mean you can use a shorter line. But uh, at this point, there's no uh, specific limit beyond the rule of thumb that um, if you want uh, good security in the quasi-static region, use less than uh, lambda on 20. Actually, that's a good point that I didn't touch on. So the question was, could you deal with this by using a soft, a tra a soft transition? So it's by um, slowly changing from low voltage to high voltage and from low resistance to high resistance. Now, in this, we've already assumed that there's a soft transition from low voltage to high voltage. Um, if they jumped up immediately, then that would obviously make things easier as far as doing the measurement. But from a theoretical point of view, and if you had basically infinite resources to try to um, measure things as accurately as possible, um, then the fact that this voltage is still relatively low here doesn't make a difference. Resistance is another um, question though. Now, you could defeat this particular attack by changing the resistance slowly such that during this period where we're working, such that those uh, reflection coefficients so that these will be the same during that region. But then you have to, you have to, you can't keep it like that forever, because otherwise that would be essentially keeping you in one of those uh, two insecure states the whole time. So you would have to change from that in practice, and it's as yet unknown exactly what effect that would have on security. Uh, but as far as uh, information theoretic, argument that doesn't affect um, that but in terms of practical attacks that certainly would make things a lot more difficult um, because the changes that you're trying to measure um, become a lot smaller because um, because um, things are changing slowly along the line and you've only got um, time scales longer order of microseconds that things are happening <coughs> 